Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, a study of love. What's love got to do with it? Um, was that Tina Turner? Uh, maybe. I don't remember. I'm not a music person, but uh, love has a lot to do with it. Everything uh, to do with it, really. Uh, if you look at God's Word and what it teaches. And uh, so uh, hopefully we can explore that topic uh, as we've already done for several lessons in this quarter. Lesson number seven is where we're at this morning. And uh, we're looking at love is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely. Um, what'd you do this past Wednesday night? Other than listen to me tell you what you shouldn't do on Valentine's Day. And those of you that were here uh, heard those recommendations, or I guess not really recommendations, things to avoid. Uh, did you buy her a card that poetically described the depth of your love? Roses are red, violets are blue. You know, I'm stuck with, uh, you're stuck with me and I'm stuck with you. You know, something like that. Uh, I can wax poetic, see. Um, or did you buy her chocolates? Um, if you didn't do any of those sorts of things, then you don't really love them. At least that's what the marketers at American Greetings and Russell Stover want you to believe. Uh, you know, it's a money racket in one sense, I guess. But uh, our modern American culture says at least one day a year you should do that sort of thing. Uh, but we know that love is an everyday activity. Some of our folks, and there's still a few of them gone this morning. Some of them I heard reporting on the weekend, but... Uh, some of them whisk their uh, spouses away to the mountains for a romantic escapade at the Sevierville and Gatlinburg congregations for the uh, Great Smoky Mountain Marriage Retreat. And uh, they were blessed, I'm sure, to hear a number of lessons on how to utilize uh, the principles of God's Word to make their marriages stronger and better. Uh, Amy and I didn't participate this year. We have for the last several years, but had uh, several other things uh, to take care of. So uh, we weren't able to do that. But uh, I appreciate events like that, and I would encourage, you know, as much as you can to take advantage of uh, such occasions. And um, I put on your little handout there, you know, things like that, as well as those who have studied topics like this in, in depth, uh, marriage and family dynamics. Uh, those things are very, uh, very important. Our understanding of, if you want to call it the science behind it, has certainly grown exponentially. Uh, in the last 100 years. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the name John Gottman. Uh, John Gottman is not, a, uh, to my knowledge, I, I don't know if he has any religious leanings or not, uh, but he is a, a clinical psychologist and he spent most of his academic career at the University of Washington. And uh, he has what he calls there, named after him because of his groundbreaking research, the Gottman Institute. But uh, he can take a couple, or he's done this repeatedly throughout the last um, more than 40 years of his uh, academic uh, research and teaching career, and he can put a couple in a room and just observe them for 15 minutes. And uh, he tells them uh, when he initially started this, um, you know, it was kind of almost like a, a movie set, so to speak, and uh, he wasn't as successful, but as things have increased, uh, our ability to, I guess, spy on each other, you know, uh, he could... Uh, with the permission of the couple, just kind of set up a secret camera, and they would forget that it was there. And he could watch a couple's interactions. And uh, he developed um, kind of a formula of sorts, if you will, uh, that within 15 to 20 minutes, he was able to gen uh, generally predict whether that couple would still be married to one another after, uh, you know, five years. And it was quite amazing. You read his research. He's wrote, written a voluminous amount of uh, things on uh, this topic. Uh, some have uh, taken over uh, his work, and um, uh, it's certainly, um, you know, things like that, that while they may not correspond in every detail with what the Bible teaches, usually, um, very interestingly, and you're not surprised by this, uh, when you find and do research like that, you'll find that the Bible has already spoken on matters like that. Um, and so uh, it's not that, you know, this guy is discovering anything groundbreaking or new. It's really that, and of course, God has given us this instruction in his word long ago, and we have failed to dig into it and find it and make proper application to it. And so uh, that's just one of those examples among many that I could cite. And uh, what we always tell, what Amy and I tell our young couples on the last quarter of every year when we have marriage or parenting class alternating year by year uh, is when you need help, get help. And, and that applies no matter. You may say, well, you know, I've been married 50 years, so it's too late for me or uh, I'm having a struggle, but I'd be too embarrassed to reach out to someone. Uh, don't let that stop you. 
if you're struggling, no matter at what stage of life you're at, that's what the church is here to do, and that's what we want to try to help you with. So there are resources, uh, talk and counsel, and professionals and non-professionals alike that can help. So uh, please uh, make yourself, um, avail yourself of those things if needed. Uh, this morning, um, love is not puffed up. That's what you read at the end of verse number four. A negative quality for sure, uh, but love is not puffed up. That's a simply profound and profoundly simple instruction, uh, but it's one that all of us need to take uh, serious consideration of. Um, love is not arrogant is another rendering that you could make of that same uh, phrase if you were actually putting it into, uh, you know, kind of mar modern vernacular. Of interest, uh, and this is just one of those things that uh, Brother Lop has spoken a little bit about on Wednesday night, uh, you might remember when he talked about textual criticism and translations and whether a translation is what's called a formal equivalent translation or a dynamic equivalent translation. Now, I know that sounds convoluted a little bit, but is the translator or are the translators, uh, are they translating from the original text, in this case, the New Testament, Koine Greek, word for word, literal word for word, or are they taking and substituting that ancient word and what it might mean idiomatically and giving it a kind of an English equivalent in the dynamic language of how we might speak today. Well, uh, of interest here, uh, love is not puffed up is a literal rendering of the Greek word used in uh, this passage. It's actually used with a negation, u, fuseo. And what does that word mean? Well, it means to inflate, to cause, to swell up, to puff up. Now, what's really curious about that, at least in my way of thinking, is that uh, compared to the modern world, in the ancient world, there were probably very few things that needed actually inflating. Now, uh, they probably could take an animal skin and inflate it and make a water-carrying uh, device out of it. That's still even a practice in certain parts of the world uh, today. Uh, but we think today, at least in a modern uh, setting that we have a lot of things that need inflating, notably, of course, uh, the tires on our automobile or our truck. And so uh, I put on there for you, if Paul had been riding in his chariot with Goodyear tires, and one went out, uh, one went flat, he'd get out and say, well, you know, I need to fusil that. I need to inflate it. I, I need to get some air in it. Well, uh, chariots didn't have Goodyear rubber uh, tires on them, so don't uh, let me mislead you in that regard. But still, uh, the word in the ancient um, language uh, still carried this idea of to puff up, to inflate, uh, if you will. And so maybe uh, the, the English Standard Version and the New American Standard uh, are trying to help us understand taking that word puffed up and just saying it means not to be arrogant. And that's maybe a more modern way of saying it, uh, but I like the word picture that carries with it puffed up. Uh, because we all know people, it just seems like they're inflated. They're kind of like the Michelin man. And maybe especially they're out of proportion when, uh, you know, their head is too big. They've got, as it were, the big head. And um, people have accused me of that. And uh, sometimes uh, people uh, do that uh, when I'm able to watch or to listen. Uh, something that, you know, when our children achieve or when they excel in uh, something uh, we, uh, maybe as parents, kind of carry ourselves with a little bit more of an uppity sort of uh, glance, and uh, we uh, might brag. And there's certainly, I don't think, anything wrong with being uh, proud of our children and their accomplishments, if their accomplishments are something that God would have them accomplish. I'm not saying that we revel if they are engaged in sinful activities, but, uh, you know, if they uh, do well at the ball game, or they uh, make good grades on their report card, or, you know, they... Uh, try to lead in worship one of our young men and you know we are congratulating them and uh, mom and dad you know you're giving a pat on the back that, that's okay uh, to feel a sense of um, happiness about that and maybe in one sense a sense of pride or joy uh, and that's I don't think anything negative in the least. Uh, Paul uses this word to help us better uh, understand it uh, several other times in this letter. And if you'll turn back just a few pages in the book of 1 Corinthians, back to chapter number 4, uh, Paul warns there uh, that uh, he and Apollos uh, were teaching and were giving them instruction from God's Word. 
And then he says, um, I want you to learn not to think, not to go beyond what is written. This is one of those, uh, I think, very key passages in the New Testament that help us understand uh, how we are to guide our lives by Scripture. Paul said, don't go beyond what is written. We have instruction. We don't need to uh, go beyond it. We don't need to add to it. We certainly don't need to take away from it. And then Paul is interested in them not going beyond what is written, that none of you be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. There's our same word, that word puffed up. And uh, apparently, it certainly comes to a head in chapters 12, 13, and 14, the Corinthian Christians, they like to boast. They like to be puffed up. They like to brag. They like to say, here's what I can do and you can't do that. Remember, this chapter 13 is set as the meat of the sandwich between chapters 12 and 14 on his discussion of spiritual gifts. And instead of using them to better the church and to uh, promote unity, it was really kind of almost pulling the church apart through this partisan way in which they were exercising them. Uh, look in that same chapter, I turn too quickly, back to chapter 4, verse 18. Some are puffed up as though I were not coming uh, to you. And that will kind of be a recurrent theme in both First and Second Corinthians, how Paul would deal with the Christians there. But I will come to you shortly if the Lord wills, and I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. Are they talking a good game or can they actually play it? Um, you know, sometimes we just like to boast with our words, but we don't back it up with our actions, uh, so to speak. And Paul is going to see whether which, were the, uh, which was the case. You are puffed up, chapter 5, verse 2. Now, why is this a problem? Because uh, this chapter, verse 1, introduces the sexual immorality, the illicit relationship that a man had, presumably with his father's wife, which we would assume not his mother, but... Uh, oftentimes his stepmother, and this was not only being accepted or tolerated, uh, it almost, at least from my maybe vantage point, verse 2, you are puffed up. There's almost kind of an underlying sense that you are proud of this activity. Now, why would they be proud of such a one exhibiting such behavior like this? Uh, if we would put it in a modern setting, it happens... Too often, and now it, it's happened so often that now it just goes by with just kind of a wink and a nod and nobody even bats an eye. Uh, but you remember, maybe we'll go back to around 2000, that's kind of a good watershed moment. So in the last uh, 25 years or so, how there are certain religious groups, Christian, using that term in the broadest sense of the word, that have studied or restudied the issue, uh, we'll just throw the hot button one out there of homosexuality. And they've studied it, supposedly, their councils or their governing bodies, which, of course, the New Testament doesn't authorize. But nevertheless, their governing bodies, their, uh, you know, councils or synods or conferences, whatever term they might go by. And uh, they have issued edicts that now we will recognize homosexual marriages or we will recognize and bless uh, these sorts of unions, I, I don't even like to call them marriages. God doesn't define marriage in that way, but that's the term, of course, that they use. The Supreme Court put its rubber stamp on that back in 2014, and um, they were celebrated, these religious groups were, by the popular culture, if you remember. Now, that's causing a bit of a little issue among some more traditional conservative religious groups. I'll ask, and they might not like it, but I, I've talked with some of them over there, and um, you know they're not trying to hide it now. Have you noticed our neighbors across the street? They've taken a word off their sign. Any of you know what I'm talking about? I can see a few people nodding your head. It no longer says united. That's the neighbors I'm talking about. It just says first, Methodist Church. They took the word united off. Why? Because the United Methodist Church issued from the higher ups that they would now be accepting and blessing, approving gay marriage. And uh, those congregations, um, as a part of that group that decided not to go along with that, split off from them and uh, as a result, had to remove that name United. They were no longer considered. Now, I don't know all of the 
politics, for lack of a better term, involved in all of that. As I said, I, I talked with a, uh, a few folks from over there, and um, here was one of the uh, individual statements. They said, we just want to do what the Bible says. I said, well, come across the street. And I said, that, that, that's all we want to do. I said, isn't that what we should? Yeah, that's what we're going to try to do. That's what we're going to try to keep doing. And so, you know, I try to keep the dialogue open, not trying to be uh, harsh or ugly in any way. But, you know, that's uh, here Paul says to these Christians at Corinth, you're puffed up. You've not rather mourned. Was it a similar setting? I can't say with certainty, but uh, sin is something that should never puff us up. We should never glory and rejoice in sin. Um, and, uh, you know, going back to my parent example, and um, I say this with all humility, and I say this aware that I'm still trying to raise children as well, but I, I remember talking with, uh, you know, parents and um, you know, as parents, we like to say, well, this is what my child's doing. This is what my child is doing. Before my boys were ever able to do anything other than run around in diapers, I remember, you know, talking to parents and they'd say, well, you know, my, my child's doing really well. They went to this school and they graduated, you know, in high and uh, with the highest of honors. And now they're working for this corporation and they've already got this and that promotion and they're climbing the ladder. And, uh, you know, they've got a large house and you know, just the preacher and me say, well, what congregation are they worshiping with there in that city? Well, you know, they just don't really have time for church anymore. They're just really busy, and I guess they'll get back to it a little bit later on, but that's just not a part of their life right now. Well, don't boast about the rest of it. That don't matter, does it? It, it doesn't matter if you graduate with honors, if you're climbing, you know, the corporate ladder, uh, if you're succeeding financially, uh, separate and apart from our spiritual responsibilities, um, you know, nothing else should cause us really to boast. Uh, Paul would say if he's going to boast, he's going to boast only in the cross. Uh, we'll notice that maybe a little later. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 1. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. It's interesting that he puts it there, and then when we come to chapter 13, he says love, it doesn't puff up. It's not puffed up. So love, by contrast, edifies. We we know that. Well, how do we see that otherwise? Uh, these people, these Christians in Corinth, probably had allowed their spiritual gifts to lead them to boasting. Um, it's connected, no doubt, with the instruction uh, that he gave earlier in the same verse. Love does not parade itself. I don't know if you could in some way perhaps parade yourself without being puffed up or be puffed up without parading yourself. That's a debate, I guess, for another time and place. But certainly Paul said that's not what love does. Uh, instead, the model of Jesus should be followed, one of humility and love, considering not yourself but others even better uh, than yourselves, being lowly in mind. Uh, Romans 12, how uh, we are to treat fellow Christians is such uh, that we are always regarding um, the needs of others, not setting our mind on high things, not being wise in our own opinion. And uh, James chapter 4 and verse 6, uh, it's true that uh, God exalts not the proud but the humble, and it's the proud that will be humbled by God. So these and dozens of other passages teach us of our duty to avoid, and here's a word for you, our puff-uppiness. I don't think puff-uppiness is a word, but you can use that if you want to and give me credit. Puff-uppiness. Sometimes we have too much of that, and you can name it pride or whatever other uh, term you want to attach to it, but uh, we need to be careful about that. Now, here's the questions uh, that we ask usually uh, just by way of discussion, and I typically give you a brief moment to maybe give me your thoughts on them before we move to the next, but uh, certainly to um, take these home and explore them further. Uh, let me, before I ask you, as I ask you the first one, how can we show a love that's not puffed up both to fellow Christians, to our family members, and to others, to kind of taking them all together? Is it possible to find some balance or uh, maybe some, you know, if you will, a way to express um, what, what is, let me just ask it this way, I guess. Um, people in the world, what is their common assessment uh, of us as the people of God? If we try to assert, uh, whether, you know, in whatever form or fashion, we try to encourage people, live the way the Bible says to live. What, what's an accusation? Uh, can you think of one that they would make in response to our trying to help them live like the Lord teaches. You think that you're just fill in the blank. Oh, 
Oh, come on. Holier than thou. You know, I don't know why it makes it sound more impressive, I guess, if you use uh, the pronoun from Elizabeth than English. You think you're just holier than thou, right? You ever been told that? Some complimentary uh, way? They didn't really mean it in a complimentary way, did they? No, they meant it in a derogatory way. You think you're holier than thou? Yes, Brother Barton. Yep, that's another common one for sure, as Brother Martin says. You think you're the only ones, right? The only ones going to heaven. And that's meant to try to shame us, I think. That's meant to try to embarrass us. Can we find a balance between the, you think you're holier than thou, and we could maybe swing the pendulum all the way to the other side and say, well, live and let live. That's the world's mantra. Live and let live. Just, you know, do your own thing. Go along to get along. Whatever works for you. Is there some balance or common ground? Or I don't even know if we should maybe seek common ground. Is there some way to live between those two extremes? I'll, I'll tell you what I've not yet done, but I, I hope as I've studied this a little bit further and thought about it some more. Um, of course, when you introduce and just tell people you're the preacher, it usually shuts down dialogue. So you guys might have more of an opportunity to do this than I will. But the next time somebody says, well, you're a Christian, you think you're holier than I am or something else. What you could say, I think maybe uh, at least to engender a pause in that person's accusation and their attack is to say, yes, I do. They'll probably kind of take a step back. And I think it'll maybe in most cases leave them speechless. So you agree to that? And here's where you would, and I would have to exhibit a great deal of calmness in our demeanor and kindness and say, well, yes, because of Jesus Christ and his great love for me. And then if you can have, you know, a 15 second, 30 second little presentation of the gospel. I'm not holy because of who I am or what I do. I'm holy because of Jesus and what he did for me. And I've accepted uh, his love and responded to his grace and I've obeyed his word and because he loves me so much, he's made me holy. And he can make you holy too. And you can have the same blessings that I enjoy and the um, hope that fills my life. Can I tell you some more about that? Would you like to? Now, again, many of them, they're just probably going to be dismissive and walk off in a huff. But yeah, I am holy. And so are you. If you're uh, a child of God, and you don't need to be ashamed of that. You're a saint. That's what the word holy, hagios, when Paul says I'm writing to the saints, he's writing to the hagios, the holy ones. People say, well, I'm a Christian, but I'm not a saint. Yes, you are. Brother Keeble, I've told you this many times before. He said, you're a saint or you ain't. You know, that's his pretty uh, straightforward way of saying it, but that's true. You're a saint or you ain't. Uh, pardon to the English, but that's right, Brian. I think so. And um, I'm not suggesting by saying, you know, when you respond to someone, yes, I am holy. Again, you're not basing that on your merits. You're not basing that on your righteousness or your attainments. You're basing that, of course, on Christ and your humble, uh, again, acceptance of what he's done on uh, your behalf. And uh, that certainly uh, was what Paul, I think, was encouraging uh, here the Christians in Corinth to remember. What you've been given, these gifts, they were given. That's the whole idea. You did not produce them of your own making. They were given to you by God. God gave someone else another gift. And because you were given a gift and they were given a gift, neither of you have a right to boast against the other and think, I'm better than you or I'm uh, whatever. Uh, God had given that as he desired and knew best. And so... Um, we show that kind of love even toward our fellow Christians, uh, toward our family members. Um, I just wrote on my handout, you know, 
uh, again, maybe uh, we need to try to balance our condemning and criticizing with maybe our compliments. Is there a time for correction? Yes. Is there a time to make criticism that we hope is constructive? Well, perhaps in our relationships, uh, iron should sharpen iron. But again, uh, that has to be some balance in that. If as a spouse, all you're ever doing is telling your spouse what they're not doing right, that's going to wear old very quickly. Uh, they're not going to feel loved. You're protesting to the contrary. Uh, if you got up grumbling and complaining and you fussed at them and uh, did all of that, and then before you go to bed at night, you just kiss them on the forehead and said, well, I love you, that's not going to erase all that you've done the previous day or the previous uh, weeks. Uh, we have to... Uh, again, uh, show that kind of uh, love that even if we are critical or even if we're uh, doing something that we hope is helpful, uh, that our attitude and our demeanor as well as our actions are uh, devoid of any of this uh, arrogance. Uh, showing a love that's not puffed up toward others, uh, serving and helping them, I think, uh, is a good way to think about that. If you're not, um, you know, willing uh, to show people that you care and that you're willing to help. Uh, there's a big term, I, I don't think John Maxwell coined it or invented it, he, for sure he didn't, because Jesus is the superlative example, but uh, John Maxwell, he's a guy that's big in the executive leadership world, and uh, he's made, I'm sure, multi-millions of dollars writing books on the topic, uh, but one of his favorite ideas is servant leadership. Servant leadership, what's that mean? That means if you're the boss and, you know, you're watching your subordinates, you know, every once in a while just jump right in there and do something with them. Um, any of you ever watch the show Undercover Boss? That kind of happens in, in that sort. Go ahead. And, you know, it has to start with our hearts. That's, that's what Jesus did. Even though he had to say things that were not pleasant, right. things that were true, Somebody, if you love somebody, they can see that in your eyes. And, you know, genuine love is different than just showing love. Absolutely. And if we really prepare ourselves and think about the situation, and we really love somebody, it comes out, it comes through. And probably nothing is easier to spot than someone faking it and someone being genuine in it. And uh, Brother Don's right. And Jesus is the perfect example. Even the people that didn't respond to him as he wanted. You think of the rich young ruler. The Bible said Jesus looked at him and loved him. And I think Mark just tells us that, not because we had any doubts that Jesus loved him, but apparently uh, we think Mark is writing, of course, with the assistance of Peter, those who were eyewitnesses as they watched that interaction take place. It was clear Jesus loved this young man. But he had to tell him something that broke that young man's heart. He had to give up his wealth and all that he had known before. And sadly, he made the poor choice of loving those things more than he loved the Lord, but he left that interaction knowing that the Lord loved him. And today, that's, I think, all we can ask for in our interactions with people. They need to leave the interaction knowing that we love them and that the Lord loved them. Now, they may not respond as they should. They may still, you know, slam a door in our face or say, I don't want none of that religion stuff. Just get out of here. But if we have conducted ourselves with kindness and humility and with love, um, I think that registers. And uh, we will have then done our part uh, to, uh, you know, meet the command and instruction to love one another and to love them as the Lord did. And what they do in response to that will be their choice.
It's almost a selfish love when you show it in that way, isn't it? If you can even put the word selfish as an adjective before. Carol's right. If I'm loving in a humble way, I'm not trying to overcompensate and make someone think I'm something other than what I am. Uh, I'm humble in that, and I demonstrate it by the way that I action. Excellent comment. Go ahead, Vic. This may be too theological of a question, so forgive me. Uh, My now, favorite type. <laughs> so, you know, when Jesus walked this earth, he, of course, performed many miracles, and yet at no point was he ever accused of being boastful or proud when performing those miracles. Right. So do you believe that the reason for why he was never accused of that is due to the nuance of being humble, being kind? It, yeah, it would have to be. I mean, uh, you know... Um, if you read the Gospels at all, and I mean, I can remember doing this as a little boy, you know, if you watch Superman on TV and mom and daddy say, you know, you can't really do that. And um, my thing was doing the Dukes of Hazard. I tried to jump my bicycle down the basement stairs. Didn't end up well. General Lee could do that. I couldn't. But if you watch somebody, you know, you say, wow, I wish I could do that. And if I could do that, I'd make sure that everybody knew I could do that. And like you said, Jesus never went around saying, hey, y'all gather around, watch this. Uh, he just did what he did, and that's probably why we have those little statements scattered throughout the Gospels where people said, no one ever spoke like this man spoke. Uh, in John chapter, is at the end of John chapter 7, the uh, temple police are dispatched uh, to arrest uh, Jesus. And, um, you know, the religious establishment, they, they'd kind of had enough of him. And uh, the Bible says, so they kind of send the officers out to get him, and, um, you know, they're waiting, they're waiting. Well, the officers come back to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said, why have you not brought him? They said, no man ever spoke like this man. This guy's different. Um, they go to arrest him in the Garden of Gethsemane, and they said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He just stepped forward and said, I'm he. They all fall back. Uh, there's some humility there. There's power in that, kind of to Carol's point as well. We think that we have to be prideful. We have to be out there. We have to, you know, step on somebody else to take a step higher. Uh, Jesus didn't do that. And when people saw that, they were amazed by it. Uh, in the ancient world, um, going even further in your theological uh, kind of rabbit hole here, um, in Greek and uh, Greco-Roman culture, humility was not a virtue. They valued strength. And Jesus turned the whole cultural world order on its head. And uh, you can actually trace that in some of the etymology of the words. Uh, the TDNT, Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, has an entry that I think is about 40 pages long on the way the Bible uses the word humility and how it contrasts with classical Greek. That's uh, kind of fascinating. But that's what Jesus uh, did. And he's ex our example uh, in all of it. So excellent points. Love is not puffed up. Now, Let's flip maybe just to the other side of the coin and go to the uh, next page and the opening of verse 5 where it says, Love does not behave rudely. And that's going to go right along with it. I'm going to go through this uh, kind of rapidly, but uh, I, I think we've already touched on several of these points. Uh, notice I give you a variety of translations. Uh, the New King James says, Does not behave rudely. The ASV and uh, King James do not, doth not behave itself unseemly, not rude, does not act unbecomingly, does not behave dishonorably. Uh, one version says, does not behave indecorously. Well, what do you mean to behave in an unbecoming manner? Uh, the word is only used uh, here by Paul in um, this passage as well as in 1 Corinthians 7.36. And there's some weird stuff going on there about marriage customs that... I'm not going to jump into with you, but uh, Paul said don't act unbecomingly in that passage. And now uh, he says that love will not act unbecomingly. Unbe uh, love is not simply rude. And maybe that's the best English word uh, that we can use by way of summary. Now, when we think of rudeness, we're thinking of the idea of impoliteness, actions not keeping with kindness. And uh, that's not an ingredient of love. Now, here... Uh, I wrote on your handout, some people including some Christians. And what I should have wrote uh, was some people including some Christians and many preachers. And I, I just say that uh, because you know it to be true as well as I do. And maybe this one's guilty of it sometimes as well. Uh, but some I know seem to take great delight in being blunt, brutal, and harsh in their interactions with others. And that's sad. They are disrespectful and tactless. And again, these are things that Jesus never did. Um, 
you will frequently encounter people that are mistaken, that are in error. And should we tell them what is true? Yes. Uh, Jesus did that again. Uh, love demands that we tell people the truth. But telling people the truth, uh, we have to do it without here behaving in a rudeful, uh, rudeful, uh, a rude way. Maybe rudeful is a word, I don't know. But uh, doing it in a way that, again, uh, does not suggest any sort of ugliness. So that was my grand, grandma's favorite word, you know, don't be ugly. I was like, I can't help it. She said, no, I'm not talking about what you look like. Don't be ugly, you know. Otherwise, she was talking about my demeanor and my attitude. Uh, don't be ugly in that way. Acts 23, verses 1 to 5, Paul, uh, even some take it as sarcasm, what he says in verse 5, after he's slapped by the high priest, uh, not knowing that he was the high priest, he says, you know, uh, you're a whitewashed wall, uh, you violate the law, and then they're uh, going to inform him, you are violating God's high priest. Okay, I didn't know, brethren, that was the high priest. It's written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Uh, Paul said, I, I needed to be kind. Maybe that was a moment. Now, you know, if somebody hits you in the chops, you're tempted to probably fly off the handle and respond to, in anger just as he did. But maybe he gathers himself here and says, you know, that's not the way that I should have, uh, should have responded. I love 1 Peter 2.23. Um, this verse um, was one that I frequently uh, pointed my, uh, my boys in the direction of. Speaking of Jesus, when he was reviled, and reviled there is a strong term that is kind of an all-encompassing word that just refers to the various ways in which our Lord was mistreated. And we typically focus on the last hours of his life, his arrest, trial, and crucifixion, and clearly that whatever 12-hour window, or really I guess you could extend it to about a 20-hour window maybe uh, from the time in the garden until his uh, eventual death, but that last day of his life he was surely mistreated. But uh, maybe Peter's encompassing, you know, the totality of his life, or at least his ministry. When he was mistreated and reviled, he did not revile in return. The justification for one boy hitting the other boy was what? He hit me first. You know, we all use that with our siblings or with the bully on the playground or somebody. You know, this is what they did to me first. So I was justified in retaliating. Not if you're interested in following the example of Jesus. Uh, courtesy and other expressions of proper kindness is what love requires us to give and to show to everyone in all situations. Um, is there ever a time to be assertive and combative with people? What do you think? I'm not by nature an assertive person, but I, uh, I realized very quickly, one of the things I learned from Amy's daddy, if you're going to be in business, sometimes you have to be very assertive and not necessarily confrontational or mean. Uh, I remember a guy, we were making funeral arrangements of all things and um, a statement of goods and services. Those of you that have made funeral arrangements know that you have to do this. And I went through, I was in a hurry because we had some other things to do. And uh, he grabbed the contract, pulled it across the table, and he said, your math's not right. This guy was a used car salesman. So he was used to, I think, looking back, you know, slipping a few things here and there. And I grabbed it and pulled it back, and I said, yes, it is. And so we had a tug of war with a piece of paper in the middle of the funeral home trying to make arrangements. Finally, I just slid it across. I said, do the math. And he was, he'd done enough contracts, again, on used cars. He could do it in his head. And after about 15 seconds, he slid back across and he said, there. I said, I was right. Well, and we had kind of an ugly little spat. And, uh, but, um, you know, is there a time to do that? Sonia gets, and every once in a while, I get dispatched by her, Jeff, to come meet somebody that's out here at the back door wanting benevolent help. And when we say, sorry, we can't help you today, this is the person you need to contact. They don't want to leave. And sometimes we have to be a little uglier than we would like to be otherwise. Uh, do we try to still love those people? Yes, no doubt about it. But, um, you know, politeness, um, I don't know. These are just the things that I'm kind of thinking out loud with you uh, that sometimes even we struggle with. But certainly in our dealings with our family, with fellow Christians, and with other people as much as is possible, do not behave rudely. Uh, don't lack tact. Don't be blunt or brutal or harsh just for the sake of saying, well, I'm right and they're wrong so I can say it however I want to say it. Ephesians 4.15 still in the Word. You remember what the Bible says? We speak the truth how? 
in love. That's still in there. We still need to do that to the best of our ability. If you want another passage just to uh, write down on your worksheet, 2 Timothy 2, 23 to 26, how the Lord's servant is to act, not fussing about everything, not arguing always, but being kind and gentle, saying thank you and please. Uh, that's what love demands in this section. Uh, we could say a lot more. They're standing at the back. They want to get in. I've got to let them. So uh, read next week and be ready to look at love does not seek its own and love is not provoked. And... Um, That'll be our time. Uh, actually, well, i got to say this. Sorry, folks in the back. We'll be gone next week. We're taking the young folks to CYC. So you've got to study lesson number uh, eight on your own. Okay? You've got to study lesson number eight on your own because Dr. Lapp will be up here in the auditorium class with John. So you study lesson eight, then we'll study lesson eight and nine, just by way of summary, next week, the first Sunday in March, the Lord willing. Thank you for your good attention this morning.